Winners and losers. Every major transition has them. With the transition to clean energy, we expect that major oil producers will lose revenue and coal miners will lose their jobs. Meanwhile, those who dominate the production of clean energy technologies like batteries and solar panels really have a lot to gain. A partial transition to alternative proteins, which has to happen for the world to meet its climate goals, would also create winners and losers. But who would they be? And what would this transition mean for national security? In this episode, we examine what this future of meat might look like. From the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, I'm Hewan Park. And I'm Noah Gordon. And you're listening to Barbecue Earth. Episode 6, Food Security Reimagined. Which resources are vital for national security? You might think of tanks, semiconductors, or steel factories, but you almost certainly don't think of lentil soup or vegan nuggets. John Bateman is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and he thinks we should reconsider this. If you look at President Biden's official national security strategy, it divides U.S. national security goals into a couple buckets. One of those buckets is what it calls global challenges. And if you look at those top three global challenges, they all are relevant to alternative proteins. Food security, climate change, pandemic prevention. In each of those areas, alternative proteins have a good shot at not solving the problem, but being one of the major contributors to addressing these problems. Let's start with food security. For most of human history, access to food has been essential for maintaining social cohesion and even military functioning. It's long been said that an army marches on its stomach, so being able to just feed your troops is a national security risk that people millennia ago would have understood. Of course, today we live in a more complicated world, and one of the main problems with contemporary meat production is its inordinate inefficiency. Meat and livestock rearing creates an incredible, unnecessary demand for energy, water, crop inputs, land, and other things like that. This inefficiency drives a lot of different security issues. For example, Although the U.S. generally has lower food insecurity than many other countries, our inefficient agriculture system makes us vulnerable to food insecurity caused by geopolitical shocks. Here's Liz Specht, the Senior Vice President for Science and Technology at the Good Food Institute. I think one example of that that we're all feeling globally right now is the current kind of global grain shortage and price spikes that are are resulting from a number of different factors, not just the war in Ukraine, but droughts and lower crop yields due to climactic events, a number of things. So, you know, a third of global grain is currently fed to animals. So that continued reliance on animal agriculture just makes it that much harder for us to have global resiliency. You can already see how the issue of food security is incentivizing some countries to become leaders in the alternative protein space. Singapore has an initiative called 30 by 30, which is a goal to get 30% of their country's nutritional needs produced locally in Singapore by the year 2030. Right now, they import upwards of 90% of their food calories. So they're very interested in these technologies that allow for more localized production, domestic production in areas where there's otherwise not a lot of agricultural sort of resource or land availability. This is true in places like Israel and China, too. Here's Noah Gordon, co-director of the Carnegie Endowment's Climate, Sustainability, and Geopolitics program. The scarcity of land and water in Israel means it imports most of its grains from overseas, and it has a strong incentive to become a leader in alternative protein research. And it's done that. And in China's case, the country is increasingly reliant on foreign food imports due to rising consumption and decreasing amounts of arable land. It's also had several deadly food safety scandals that have led many Chinese people to trust foreign brands over local ones. Beyond food security, alternative proteins can also address another global threat. Bateman says this threat is a challenge that humans have faced for as long as we've existed. Disease. 
One of the most famous and devastating pandemics in modern human history was the 1918 so-called Spanish flu. Most people don't think it actually originated in Spain. We don't know exactly where it originated, but it killed millions around the world. And there's some evidence that it might have actually originated on a U.S. swine farm. Now, 1918 was well before the era of concentrated factory farming that we have today. And those conditions really breed disease in a variety of different fashions. To start, there's the physical closeness of all of these animals. In episode one, we examined concentrated animal feeding operations, or factory farms, where animals are housed in confined spaces literally cheek to cheek, with their waste stored in huge manure lagoons. But another problem is the actual DNA of these farm animals. The genetics of these animals are highly homogenous because they've been genetically bred to be as efficient as possible in terms of meat production and rapid growth. But this creates a condition whereby disease can spread very rapidly within these populations. So for example, there have been instances where turkeys that spend part of their time outdoors are exposed to the overflight of migratory birds and the falling excrement from those birds can then infect those turkeys and then, because of the conditions of a factory farm, could jump to a human worker in a way that you might not see in another place. As the world continues to become more and more connected, the risk escalates for both the creation and spread of disease among these factory farm animals. The world has already seen how merciless disease can be when it comes to animal agriculture. Think about things like African swine fever virus wiping out nearly 50% of China's pork production over the course of a year or two. Think about things like the H5N1 avian flu that's sweeping the entire world right now and is causing huge volatility and, and flock loss. And that's not all. According to Bateman, our agricultural system is threatening even the tools we have to fight off these types of diseases. Everyone's familiar with antibiotics, penicillin, these are maybe the greatest or among the greatest public health innovations of modern times. But our ability to continue using those magical medicines is under threat by the overuse of antibiotics, which essentially causes the bacteria to evolve in such a way that it would be resistant to today's and potentially to future antibiotics. This type of microbial resistance is a huge problem. It's why you shouldn't flush old antibiotics down the toilet into the sewage system. And it's another reason why our animal agriculture system needs to change. The problem with factory farms is that animal agriculture is actually the primary, even overwhelming user of medically significant antibiotics. Mostly, they're not going to hospitals. They're going to factory farms for two reasons. One is to combat disease for these animals that are kept in incredibly unsanitary and unhealthy conditions. And the other, unfortunately, is sometimes to stimulate the growth of the animals as well. This tremendous use of these antibiotics in factory farms then creates conditions whereby so-called superbugs can gradually evolve over time. Think about the next global pandemic, the next COVID-19. Many public health experts do expect that the next pandemic will also be a virus, not a bacteria that you can treat with antibiotics. But even in a viral pandemic, ineffective antibiotics would pose a huge problem. What we've seen in COVID-19 is that there can be an interactive effect between a viral pandemic and bacteria. So, for example, if you look at the death certificates and medical records of people who die of COVID-19, Often, COVID-19 is what gets you into the hospital, but you may ultimately succumb to a comorbidity like pneumonia. Pneumonia is a bacteria, and you can combat that using antibacterial measures. It would be terrible to find ourselves in a place where a future COVID-19-like pandemic arises, and there's millions of people dying of some kind of hybrid pneumonia that we can no longer treat through antibiotics because of overuse in factory farming. Reducing animal agriculture and increasing alternative proteins is a path toward improving food security and public health. 
Bateman adds that it's also a path towards strategic competition on the global stage. We're living in an age where U.S. policymakers who are in charge of national security are increasingly worried about what's called strategic or emerging critical technologies, wanting to maintain U.S. leadership and control of the next wave of artificial intelligence, 5G, semiconductors, and on and on. Biotech is a growing part of this panoply of strategic technologies. And within that, alternative proteins have many of the same rough characteristics as some of these other critical tech areas. Um, So for example, it's high value add, it's a large potential market with many spin-off or catalyzing connections to other areas of biotech. It's a form of advanced manufacturing. Alternative proteins have triggered cultural backlash in some circles. Think of how Italy has banned cultivated meat or how Wisconsin senators are trying to keep oat milk down. But still, Specht says there is some bipartisan support for alternative protein research. There's been bipartisan support for these initiatives to get, say, research funding directed towards alternative proteins. There's a a strong kind of jobs and economic security angle and global competitiveness uh, in terms of technology. So I think that is not restricted to any one political party. Alternative proteins show what the future of meat might look like. But what will this shift away from traditional livestock farming mean for the economies and politics of different countries around the world? Coming up next, after this short break, we think through who will emerge as winners and losers in a protein transition, and where the U.S. might be left standing. What happens in Ukraine has consequences for what's happening AI. Hello, listeners. I'm Gabrielle Sierra, host of the Why It Matters podcast from the Council on Foreign Relations. Look, the world of international affairs can feel overwhelming and complex, but it also shapes our lives every single day. So it pays to know what's going on out there. Why It Matters is a foreign policy podcast for the rest of us. And with a little bit of humor and a lot of questions, we're here to break down global topics and bring the world home to you. So join us every two weeks on Why It Matters, wherever you listen. Just because something is necessary doesn't mean it will be easy. Noah Gordon and John Bateman say that a major shift away from animal meat won't happen overnight, and there will be growing pains. Look, there's a reason that academics call agriculture a hard-to-abate sector. We need to produce a lot of food, and we'll have to have some negative emissions to cancel out the remaining emissions from agriculture, even in a net-zero world in future decades. But eventually there will be a shift, and like any transition, it will create winners and losers. When it comes to the energy transition, for example, we worry for the future of oil producers like Nigeria or Bolivia. The winners and losers of a protein transition, which is by no means assured, but is truly essential to global and U.S. security, remain to be identified. You could divide it up based on supply chains and who benefits from which component. First, we have the manufacturing component. These are all of the quote-unquote ingredients that go into making alternative proteins like soybeans, sugars, amino acids, energy, land, and maybe animal stem cells and labs for cultivated meat. Gordon, Bateman, and Liz Specht explain. A shift towards alternative proteins would, of course, have a big impact on people who raise animals for sale or grow crops to sell as animal feed. A common phrase that I hear is a notion of a just transition in the same way that we think about making sure that coal miners have a path to alternative employment in a post-fossil fuel world. We need to do the same thing for slaughterhouse workers, for example. The inputs for alternative proteins will absolutely come from agriculture. So farmers who are producing feedstocks and feed crops for animal agriculture today can absolutely and will have a role to play in the alternative protein sector. Alternative proteins do use these feedstocks more efficiently. So, you know, in terms of total volume of demand for those types of crops, if we're talking about kind of a large scale transition to alternative proteins, Those volumes may be lower, but there's a lot of work going on to produce kind of more specialty versions or strains or breeds of crops that would have optimized properties for use in alternative protein products. 
At the international level, there's a bunch of other components in the alternative protein supply chain beyond just manufacturing. Here's Bateman again. There is the intellectual property that drives these innovations. There's the market fit in terms of adapting alternative protein products to different markets around the world. There will be a scramble to get the trade policy right, the patents right. It's hard to predict exactly which countries will emerge on top in this transition. But some leaders and potential winners are starting to emerge. In many ways, the United States is the world's current leader in alternative proteins. We have many of the largest and most successful companies as far as plant-based meat production. And we also have several of the cutting-edge companies and university labs that are involved in the next generation of alternative proteins like cultivated and fermented meat. But there's plenty of competition in this space. Some of the other alternative protein leaders are small countries with limited arable land or fresh water, who have a particular interest in getting their food as efficiently as possible. SPECT explains. As of right now, Singapore and the U.S. are still the only countries that have actually approved cultivated meat for sale to the public. But we know that cultivated meat is under review in several other countries, including Israel, New Zealand, Switzerland, the U.K., most likely others as well. Of course, it seems intuitive that these leaders would fare well in a protein transition. But Bateman says this is complicated by the fact that a lot of these countries are both leaders in alternative proteins and still quite wedded to traditional meat. The U.S. is simultaneously the leader in alternative proteins and one of the world's largest meat producers. And so different parts of the United States, different industries, different constituencies, different geographies have different things to gain and lose from an alternative protein transition. So, for example, a protein transition might be great for certain companies and national security concerns like public health and food security. But at the same time, some individual regions heavily dependent on animal agribusiness might face difficult economic challenges. Here's Gordon. The same goes for China. Since 2019, China has been the number one meat importer in the world. It still produces most of its own pork and a lot of its own poultry and beef. But a decline in arable land has made it difficult for China to keep up with domestic demand for meat. Meat is clearly important for the country, and the government even has a strategic reserve for pork. At the same time, China is showing a lot of interest in alternative proteins. It released a five-year plan where they specifically point to cultivated meat and to alternative proteins as priorities for promotion. And just as China processes most of the minerals the world needs for solar panels and batteries, it's also a leading processor of alternative protein ingredients. According to SPECT, Beijing is well-positioned to benefit from a protein transition. China is a major global processor for a lot of the ingredients and raw materials that go into alternative proteins. Much to the chagrin of a lot of alt-protein companies that are trying to buy ingredients, they often are growing peas in, say, Canada, and then shipping them to China to get pea protein isolates, and then shipping them back, say, to the U.S. for producing end products. So China is already a huge powerhouse in terms of the raw materials. They've got a lot of manufacturing capacity in terms of fermentation capacity. So they really are well poised to make a fast shift in this direction. These competing interests are very present in the case of Brazil, too. In 2022, Brazil exported nearly 3 million tons of beef, more than any other country in the world. This makes beef production a huge chunk of Brazil's economy. Gordon says that on the one hand, It's easy to imagine how a protein transition could really hurt Brazil's economy, given how wedded the country is to beef exports and beef production in general. You might call it a carno state. But even here, in a country so dependent on meat, you can see some enthusiasm and interest for alternative protein development. In fact, SPECT says Brazil has the potential to remain a protein powerhouse. There's some activity certainly going on in Brazil. One, of course, they're home to many of the world's largest meat companies that have an enormous presence there. But those meat companies also have stated interest in alternative proteins and actually are acting quite deliberately on that interest. JBS, for example, has launched a a cultivated meat research center. 
There's meat companies in Brazil that have pretty well fleshed out product lines in the plant-based meat space. Meat producers, of course, have a lot at stake in the conventional meat production system. But Speck notes that they're also aware of the vulnerabilities of this system. From a meat manufacturer's perspective, there are a lot of reasons that alternative protein production is more attractive simply from the perspective of resiliency, lack of vulnerability to things like disease or slaughterhouse shutdowns or some of the challenges that we saw emerge during COVID, for instance, where there was really discontinuous labor supply and market demand. A lot of meat companies are really eager to have a more diversified portfolio of products. And that's exactly how a lot of meat companies are framing their interest in alternative proteins is protein diversification to make them a a more resilient company. Alternative proteins offer plenty of benefits to our national security interests. They're an avenue for increased food security, fighting disease, and even strategic competition in arenas like critical technology. But perhaps more importantly, They offer a path forward and a change in our current system of destructive animal agriculture and factory farming. In this, Bateman finds some hope. It's the system that we have. It's not the system that anyone should want or really does want. People eat meat today despite how it's produced, not because of how it's produced. And there's virtually no rational defense for contemporary factory farming. So Policymakers and consumers everywhere should hope for a world in which we can fill the same consumer needs, but in ways that are less environmentally destructive, less costly to human health and well-being and societies around the world. That's a great world that we should all want. And uh, alternative proteins provide perhaps the best pathway toward getting there, although nothing is assured. And with that, we've reached the last episode of Barbecue Earth. Thank you so much for listening. And if you like the show, please rate and review Barbecue Earth on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. From the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, I'm Hewan Park. And I'm Noah Gordon. And you've been listening to Barbecue Earth. This episode was written by Noah Gordon and me, Hewan Park, and produced by me with assistance from Emily Hardy, Daniel Helmesy, Tim Martin, and Zachary Mills. Music was composed by me and artists on Artlist. Thank you to Emily Hardy and Daniel Helmesy for research support, Ryan DeVries for fact-checking, and Amy Mellon, Jocelyn Solly, and Amanda Branham for their graphic design work. You have been listening to an audio production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Views expressed are those of the host and guest panelists and not necessarily those of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Subscribe to Carnegie Podcasts on popular podcast platforms such as iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at carnegieendowment.org.